Hi, uh, welcome everybody. So I'm working as a sensor developer at Rosen. So what is Rosen? Uh, it's a company who's inspecting uh, pipelines. If you want to learn more about it, just visit our spon uh, sponsor booth. It's uh, that one with the chocolate eggs. And you could also see a device which we are using to inspect the pipelines there on display. And these kind of devices are equipped with a lot of sensors. And that is uh, related to my work. So I'm a sensor developer, and that includes assembling sensor prototypes, which are testing in a lab. And that's where I'm using uh, Python. And I would like to give you a short insight into a typical procedure in the lab. So we are uh, hosting a web interface with Fast API. There we will adjust our measurement parameters like setup of the sensor, uh, what uh, sample is uh, lying below the sensor, and so on. And at some point, we push a start button. This will cause um, a to-do list to be created in a Redis database. And this to-do uh, list will be consumed by our control process. So it will take one uh, step from, the, from this to-do list, which may be a command uh, just to measure. This command is published on a Redis channel. Our sensor process is reading this command, triggers the sensor to do a measurement. This process answers that the measurement is finished, which is again published on uh, a Redis channel. Then it will be uh, picked up by the control process again, which knows now to um, take the next command from the to-do list. This may be a move command, so the sensor measures and is then moving to the next position on the, uh, on the test sample, which may be just move right two millimeters. Then when the movement is finished, there is again a finished message published on a Redis channel. The control process knows to, um, yeah, to release the next command, uh, which could be again uh, a command for the sensor to measure until the complete to-do list, uh, to list is fully processed. Uh, this data, which is also published, uh, the sensor data, which is also published on Redis channels, is uh, consumed by a, a HDF5 a file writer, which is uh, assembling large HDF files, each uh, one for each um, series of measurements. And yeah, today I. Uh, as the name of the talk uh, already mentions, it's about uh, the web interface. So what we are doing with the web interface is uh, we have a preview of the sensor data. So one measurement could take about uh, one hour. And if we want to know if maybe there's just a little wire damaged, which uh, disturbs our measurement or even makes it uh, unusable, it's nice to see it instantly and not after waiting for a long time. Then we have an indicator of the progress of our measurement. So that's more or less the state, how many items from the uh, to-do list have been uh, processed. And finally, when the measurement is finished, we uh, can review the, the results. Today, I would uh, focus on uh, two parts of this. The first one is just how is the uh, sensor data transported to uh, Redis. And the second one is how uh, do we connect our um, web interface to Redis. And there I will focus on sensor data preview only. But now to focus on the key components of this, I will switch over to my uh, hobby project. It's a flight data recorder. So it all started with a colleague who owns a home-built aircraft, this one. Um, and this, is in the pro this aircraft is in, is in the process of certification. And that requires some uh, performance data. And so the idea was born just to create 
a little flight, uh, flight data uh, recorder based on a Raspberry Pi, this one. Um, so it, uh, as you see, the infrastructure looks somehow similar uh, to the, uh, our lab setup. Uh, however, uh, it's more or less, uh, in most cases, uh, unidirectional uh, communication. So there is a GPS receiver, which is mainly um, yeah, uh, determining the position where, where we are, uh, publishes this once a second uh, to a Redis channel. Then there's a barometer, which has a slightly higher uh, sample rate and publish, uh, publishes the current pressure uh, to the Redis channel. And finally, there is an orientation sensor uh, setup, which consists of a combined sensor accelerometer, gyro and magnetometer to, um, yeah, uh, to know the aircraft orientation. Uh, in the initial state of this project, uh, the FAST API was just uh, used to um, export and review data so that we could uh, get such a um, GPS track as you can see here. It's a flight above uh, Lingen, the city where I'm uh, living and working. And here you could see um, a height profile. Um, the device itself, you can uh, see here, it's mounted inside the uh, cockpit of the aircraft. This little device here. Uh, now let's take a closer look at, at the device. So it's exactly this one. Um, here's a GPS unit, and the magnetometer, the gyro and accelerometer, and the barometer here. Um, the uh, item in between here is a, a power supply electronics. It's connected uh, to a small uh, LiPo battery. It's as small as uh, this here. And it would uh, last for about uh, four to eight hours, depending on the uh, CPU you load. And finally, uh, on the bottom, there is a Raspberry Pi uh, Zero W, which means it has uh, Wi-Fi. And I brought today a mobile Wi-Fi hotspot, um, which is being used uh, to connect to this device with my computer. And later I will publish the credentials for that, that you uh, could try it by yourself. Um, I didn't mention before all the um, setup I'm using is published on GitHub. So the GPS tracker device is uh, located at my GPS tracker repo, but this, that doesn't include the live data visualizas visualization. And that was added just for uh, this talk uh, as demonstration. So at first uh, I had to, uh, or I removed the processing of uh, GPS data, as here inside the, this building we don't have any GPS reception. Uh, we still will have the barometer and the orientation sensor. Yeah, now I modified my um, fast RP uh, web interface a bit, so it's using web sockets for streaming live data. And yeah, but. At first, let us have a look how uh, we um, get the data from the sensor uh, to, uh, to Redis. So it's a bit simplified code. So we import just the Redis client, JSON library, time, and the implementation for our um, to control our barometer sensor. You could look up the details on my GitHub repo. Yeah, then we initialize a uh, Redis connection, our sensor, and then simply yeah, run continuously in this while loop, um, reading sensor data, publishing uh, to a channel which is named barometer. It's uh, using JSON dumps. It's, uh, you make a JSON string of that, and the JSON string just looks like this in the box on the right. It contains a timestamp, the uh, current pressure, the current temperature, and a name of the sensor. Now let's have a look how to consume that data. So again, we need the uh, Python Redis client and uh, JSON. So again, we create a Redis connection. 
we create a PubSub uh, object and we are subscribing to the channel barometer, run a for loop uh, over the pubsub.listen and then um, in every iteration we could uh, decode a JSON string, the JSON string to obtain our barometer data and decide how to process, how to do further processing of that. Uh, now let's come to our first uh, demo. So we have the barometer, which publishes the pressure data to the Redis channel. Then our web interface, which is um, reading that data. And now let's just try it. So maybe. So this is now um, pressure read from this uh, sensor here. You see it's lying on top of this desk. Now I take it, put it to the ground, and put it up again. Now you could see it's about uh, yeah, a bit more than a meter. Uh, so just by measuring the, um, the ambient, ambient pressure, you could uh, read, ah, it was stuck for, for a moment. Just by measuring the ambient uh, pressure, you could um, yeah, measure um, Altitude, it's like it's done in an aircraft, and the precision is. Uh, oh, normally it's it's not stuck. Maybe there is some interference with the Wi-Fi here. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's how um, altitude of aircrafts is measured, and yeah, and uh, the uh, plot is done using. Uh, Plotly, which is available for um, Python directly, as well as as a JavaScript library, which is used in my case. Now let's continue with the uh, talk. Um, yeah, how to create uh, the uh, web interface. So um, again, I simplified the code a bit uh, for the presentation, so exception handling and so on is not done here. Uh, we are using FastAPI, uh, WebSocket from FastAPI, and the static files. We are using the uh, Async IO uh, Redis client, and yeah, we create a Redis uh, connection here. As discussed in another, another talk today, maybe it's not a good idea to do it uh, on a global scale, but uh, yeah, so it's how I'm doing it currently. Um, yeah, and then uh, this code here is just to create uh, the static file hosting. So that just means there are some HTML and JavaScript files in a folder called static, and they will just uh, host it at the endpoint static of our, our web API. The more important part is the WebSocket, which is uh, hosted at the endpoint uh, WS uh, IMU pressure. So this is what the one for the combined data of the position and pressure sensor. Mm. Um, so again, we are creating a PubSub object. Uh, we are subscribing to uh, the uh, IMU pressure channel, and then there's simply running a while loop. Uh, we are trying to um, get a message from the pubsub object. Um, so it's a little bit different to the um, pubsub.listen in the example before. If there is a message available, we just send it through the WebSocket. Otherwise, uh, we are doing a short timeout here, and uh, yeah, this is would run continuously as long as the WebSocket is open. But now let's take a look how to consume it. So this is a bit uh, JavaScript. Uh, the first uh, line is uh, just assembling the URL, uh, where to connect uh, to. So instead of HTTP, it's here, it's just WS uh, at the beginning with our API endpoint. We have a WebSocket object. And now, the important part is just to um, create an on, or just to define the on message uh, function. This function is run every time a new message arrives on the WebSocket. 
Um, this is uh, passed as a JSON. Uh, so this is a JSON string. It's passed. Then it will be a, a Java ob uh, object, maybe similar to a Python addict. And then this is just a generalization for all the following uh, visualization I will show, just calling some um, some function to visualize the data with the uh, with the content of our message. Uh, now let's, as we talked a lot about um, um, airborne species, I brought a bird. And let's try another visualization. So this is done using 3JS. Uh, now let's just uh, try a few, uh, few flight maneuvers. So if we doing a steep climb and a strong descent, now let's fly a curve. Or maybe just upside down. Hang around a bit. Yeah, and as you see, it reacts nearly instantly. So it's a few milliseconds delay. And um, yeah. Let's continue. Now uh, let's take a look at the performance. So there are so it's, it's so the bird is currently equipped with a single core Raspberry Pi. The fast API is run as a, uh, as a single process, and yeah, the sensor data rate is 12.5 hertz. And uh, I tested this uh, at home, so up to um, eight clients are possible, and the delay is still extremely uh, low, and the data rate of nearly 12 hertz could still be maintained. As soon as um, I exceed uh, eight clients with that setup, uh, it will dramatically uh, slow down. So, and even the commands may stay in the queue, in that case, so it may happen, you move the bird and wait about half a minute, and then uh, it reaches the message which made the movement, and then it's, it bec uh, becomes a really uh, long delay here. Yeah, but now uh, let's uh, come to the uh, final presentation where we combine all the sensor data. So let's uh, get to the pilot's view. So we have the artificial horizon. Then we have the compass. Um, yeah, the altitude uh, display is yeah is made for real aircraft altitude, you, so you will not see a movement here, but maybe you could see um, here the vertical speed indicator. Um, okay. Mm. Yeah, and I think now. Uh, it's your turn. Uh, you could try to connect to one of these two devices with a um, Wi-Fi hotspot. Yeah, if, if it doesn't work now, maybe you could uh, visit us at uh, our sponsor booth. Maybe we could uh, try there again. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your talk. So there's a question. Why did you choose Redis over Rabbit MQ or Zero MQ? Um, so mainly it's uh, because I I just started with, with Redis. And in our lab setup, 
It's also used uh, as a database. So we are storing there some configuration data. We are storing this kind of to-do list and all this stuff. And so we are just uh, using, or I'm just using that what I already know. Um, so, but maybe for the um, yeah unidirectional communication, maybe zero MQ what could also be a solution. But Redis has shown to be really fast. So yeah. Thank you. And like, did you think about the scalability? Like, if you are tracking ten thousand birds, how will you scale the product? Uh, could uh, could you repeat the question? So it's about like scalability of the backend. So if you are tracking 10,000 birds, what will be the bottleneck? Mm, okay, uh, please. Uh, uh, um, oh, so what I played around, so, so it's, uh, it's directly run on the Raspberry Pi and the, uh, the backend is running there. Um, so I found out the bottleneck is not, at first, is not uh, Redis, but was the single, um, uh, single process uh, fast API, so with the hosting of the WebSocket. So I did not analyze in detail of if it's just the connection of the WebSocket to the browser, which is slowing down, but maybe it's the processing in, in the single fast API uh, process. So a solution could be uh, to um, yeah, run multi multiple processes. So each of the processes could um, could subscribe to, to the Redis, and then maybe on. So this uh, is a, a, a four core a core, a core a quad core um, CPU on this Raspberry Pi. So maybe I could start a four process or even more on that. And yeah, if it's for a much larger audience, maybe uh, data even needs to be duplicated to um, to other um, other devices, and yeah, then uh, distributed from there. Thank you. And there's a final question: like, how do you save the histor historical data? Hmm? How do you save the historical data? Um, <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. This uh, this one is so the historical data in my GPS tracker, I think. Yes. So currently it's just stored also in Redis. So it's I think Redis is writing when when you don't modify the configuration, it's once a minute. Or if you collect more than hundred or message or something like that, it's dumping the data to um, to the SD card in that case, and. Yeah, it's it's enough for um, doing several flights and so on, and then later it will be um, exported and uh, stored on some other device. Yeah. Thank you. And there is one more question: like, all these sensors are publicly available or not? Uh, so all sensors of my hobby project are publicly uh, available. So that's why I chose it. So there is. Um, this um, electronics here, it's called from a company called Ozmaker in Australia. I think it's about uh, 40 to 50 euros with all these sensors on top of this. And this is a PyJuice um, yeah, power supply board. It's also similar at a similar price. So the whole um, flight data recorder is about maybe 100 euros and Depends on, on which kind of sensor you would would like to spend a bit more or less. Yeah. And yeah, the code for the uh, visualization is available here. And you even could replace the bird with a with a I think a pony and um, a flamingo and a parrot. The, so these <laughs> models are all also available in, in this uh, 3JS examples uh, I used for this talk. Thank you. That's all. Please give a warm applause.